Welcome to The Bouquet Toss, the podcast that helps you plan your wedding day your way. We're your hosts, Jessica and Sari, and each episode we deep dive into the traditions and trends you either love, hate, or just don't understand to help us all figure out why we do weddings the way that we do. The Bouquet Toss is a Love Stories TV podcast, and today we are here to talk about Wedding headlines from 2024. Yes. yes. I think it's no, like, surprise or no argument can be made that, like, media doesn't impact the way we all think about weddings. Yeah. Like, we've talked about it so many times on the show before, especially social media. This time we're talking specifically about major media. Yeah. And the news. And there's always wedding headlines, I think, that will always be true. But we wanted to do a little bit of a roundup to see what were we all talking about this year? How did it affect weddings? What do we think? Let's, yeah. let's unpack them. Let's unpack them. Great. So one common theme I think that we're seeing and that we've seen, I think this year, but every year is always about costs and how much more expensive weddings are getting. So mm -hmm. here's some example headlines okay. uh, from this year. How couples can manage sticker shock as inflation drives up wedding costs. Did you write that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. That was uh, covered in, in Edmonton. Okay. But, um, and then other similar ones. Wedding costs soar as inflation rises. Inflation driving a thorn into wedding plans with Oof. budding newlyweds trimming flowers from their budgets. Oh, wow. Which okay. actually, you can speak to that. I can. I mean, look. Flowers are one of the biggest expenses when you come down to it because I think – talk about sticker shock. I think that's one of the ones that – like I think at this point you're like, okay, food, drinks, going to cost some money. Right. Nobody really knows how much the flowers are going to cost them right. until like they get that quote and they're like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> um but that's not just true of 2024. That's been true for years. Um, you know, I went the route of renting silk florals because I was conscious that that was a part of my budget that I didn't want to allocate to my higher spend. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, look, the sticker shock of it all is what I want to talk about mm -hmm. because it's funny to me that this can make headlines. Like this could be any year yeah. because this – there is always going to be sticker shock when it comes to weddings. I think, of course, we're in a time right now, like 2024, where like everything is feeling a little bit harder. Things are feeling more expensive. Like we're all, you know, and it trickles down and, yeah. you know, everything ends up being a little bit more expensive. But do you really think it's that much different than, let's say, 2023? No. I mean, it's ever increasing. Like the cost of everything is going up. Right. And obviously inflation is a thing. So it's definitely no surprise. But it just seems to be hammered home over and over and over in the media. And yeah, I think it can influence in some ways for good. Like it makes more people aware of yeah. the true expenses involved, um, which is good for everyone. I personally feel like there's such a lack of transparency about costs and, and so much of the wedding industry that like that information needs to be shared more. I mean, look, we could do an entire episode on cost transparency. I think we will. <laughs> I, we probably will. I mean, like, yes, I think this headline is kind of hitting on it. People don't know. And it's so funny. Like, people don't know how expensive weddings are. And yet we go to them all the time. You hear somebody planning their wedding and talking about how expensive it is all the time. Um, look, I'm a 2024 bride. Do I think things are more expensive? Yes, I would compare it to my sister who got married eight years ago. Mm. It, you can't compare it. No. Like, it's just, yes, we are in a different situation. Um, but I think if every vendor w didn't, like, keep their prices behind, you know, and maybe it's a business tactic, like, you have to give them your info so that they have your info and can kind of, like, sell to you. It is sales. But not having it be public facing is a big reason why people just sticker shock is the word like people just don't know right they don't know what they don't know don't and know so you don't it's know. a surprise mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure okay so moving on to some other headlines great um this one i thought was wild i mean everybody's trying to find ways to like make their wedding more affordable or make like their dream happen within their given budget but this one really kind of shocked me. Um, wedding guests required to purchase $333 <gasps> tickets to attend couples New York City nuptials. Oh, my God. I want to talk about this. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've actually – I heard of another, a different one. Okay. That was like $400 something. dollars. Mm. But, you know, hands down, like 
confusing for people to hear, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and the fact that I've heard of this more than once is also like, is this a trend? Right. Um, I don't think it should be, for the record. Okay, great. Let, let me get, give me your take. <laughs> I mean, okay. Everyone has like their own certain set of circumstances that they're working with. But you have to be kind of realistic about like, can you legitimately afford to do this thing that you have in your head or or not? And if you can't, like, why would you ask to pass that cost along to your friends and family and guests? I yeah, just I, I, I take a bit of issue with it, to be honest. But like, is it their gift or is it like separate from the gift? Well, that's a great question, because if you're charging your guest a, a ticket, an entrance fee to your wedding, you can't also then expect a gift on top of that. Right. Right. And so that's the thing. Like, you know, I think a lot of it, just in general, I think always people don't know how much to gift at a wedding. Oh, yeah. And it was like for a while, it was very much like the cost of a plate. Right. right? At this point, the cost of a plate is so much higher. Yeah. Talk about the other headline, inflation, if that's what we think it's from. Right. But, like, the cost of a plate is so much higher than you would think. So the gift, if we're going by that logic, mm -hmm. like, should meet that. And, you know, I think— Some people would argue no, but— you know. Well, right. And yeah. so it's like if you're prescribing how much you're charging somebody to come, you're prescribing what they're giving you as a gift. If we think that's the gift, we have right. to get more clarity. <laughs> but, like, that—it's like in, on the one hand, it's like, well, if it kind of represents, like, covering the cost— But it—I right. don't know. I, I can't justify it. I don't know. I don't know how to justify it. I think, like, it's a bold move and— this one in particular, they did like this whole like tour of the city. Yeah. Like these people. I think it included ticket, like a bus ride a or bus something. Ride, like seeing around like, Manhattan. Right. You know. Right. So like they made an experience. Right. And we buy tickets for experiences. True. Right. Um, I don't know. Right. It's 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 a sticky one. It's not one I would have thought we would be talking about. And no, certainly not. Um and you know, it's it's interesting to like ask your direct, you know, circle of the people you're inviting to your wedding to to contribute. But then there's like this whole other thing where I've seen people like crowdfunding their weddings or like doing like a GoFundMe basically for their wedding. Really? Yeah. And like asking strangers on the internet to help pay for their wedding or something. Wow. Because of, they have like some sort of like different circumstances or not always. I mean, I definitely think there are circumstances like that. And there's actually like a really great organization called Wish Upon a Wedding where vendors and stuff um, will donate their services and stuff to help. Love that. You know, couples who are in need or going through like a terminal diagnosis and things like that. That's like incredible. Yeah. This is like something completely separate. Actually, Stone Ages ago, like when I was plan planning, you know, back in the late 2000s, there was a blog that had popped up at one point and she was like basically crowdfunding her wedding and asking people to pay because she wanted like bacon wrapped, you know, steak or shrimp or whatever. And she, it was it was really like shocking to see somebody just say, like, I can't afford this, but I want other people to pay for it for me. And there was right. like no need or no demonstrated like reason why it was like where's the justification but right like is it savvy or savage <laughs> <laughs> i don't know I I mean, don't we're know. always trying to find ways for people to cut costs or find money do have a bride hustle like me you know right and it, but it begs the question, you know, savvy or savage? Yeah. That is kind of like, talk about crowdfunding. What are your thoughts on the QR code for the bachelor par bachelor bachelorette party to like buy the bride a drink? I mean, I I personally have never donated to, to a stranger's <laughs> bachelorette party if it, it, on a personal level. But I guess if you think about it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the digital age version of like buying the bride a shot at the bar. I don't know. Like, right. I mean, it is. Yeah. Like if you were there with her and mm. you bought her a drink, like, and you might, like if you, they're, you know, a fun group of girls, whatever, you're like, oh, let's celebrate with them. So where are these QR codes? Well, that's the thing. Like I usually see them on someone's like Instagram stories, oh. which would then be going to like your friends. Your friends. -ish. But then why weren't your friends invited to the bachelorette party? Right. Like, 
I don't know. I mean, you know, and then we get on our whole diatribe of like <laughs> the bachelorette party is like when it's this crazy expense. And like if you have to like crowdsource to then afford parts of it. Right. Like, I think that's the thing that I worry about the most is that people are seeing these these um, representations of what is being made normalized by social media and influencers and people with a lot more money than like you might have, like watching these people's lives on social media and then like wanting to aspire to that, but not having the money to do it. And then like just asking, not asking for handouts, but you know what I mean? Like just asking other people to fund it. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, and like no shade <laughs> to anybody, no matter what age they are, but I do think it's a younger bride thing. Oh, you think? I think like, I feel like it's disappeared a bit. Mm. Um, it was definitely like really, really big a couple of years ago and maybe even pre-pandemic. Uh, and then I feel like it took like maybe a backseat, but I have started to, started to see it come back with like Honestly, like the Gen Z bride, I feel like mm. more so than the millennial bride. Hmm. Um, and I honestly feel like it's because they can drink more <laughs> without feeling terrible the next day. Like the older Those we get, were the days. <laughs> right? I feel like the older you get, like the older you are at your bachelorette, yeah, the less drinking you do. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's true. There was one viral TikTok recently that I saw that's like, oh, yeah, we're going out. Woo woo. And then it's like 930 p.m. Everyone's like passed yeah, out. And it's like literally. bachelorette parties in your 30s. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Too real. Uh, OK, so what next? Um, so I thought this one was interesting. This was an opinion piece, but a woman wrote, I regret the money I spent on my wedding and the factors that led me to blow my budget entirely. And she kind of outlines like really like a lot of things that we've talked about on the show, like how social media really set unrealistic expectations that she felt like she had to live up to. Mm. It's this kind of like unattainable level of detail and luxury um, that maybe wasn't really realistic for her. And she ended up, you know, overspending and maybe taking on a bit of debt to pay for it. Mm. Well, first of all, she didn't find the bouquet toss or the budget savvy bride beforehand, clearly. <laughs> um, if but... I had a nickel for every time someone said, I wish I'd heard of your site before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's probably fairly common. I don't think, though, I feel like this headline makes it seem like she regrets the wedding as a whole. Right. And I think it's very common for you to regret some part, like for you to have built something up in your head and then gotten there on the day of and been like, we could have done without that. Mm -hmm. So that seems like a headline we're going to literally see till the end of time. Like yeah. that will happen to a lot of people, unfortunately. I do think that the what it's alluding to but not saying is that like the trend of a smaller wedding, the trend of uh, – like sacrificing different things so that you can keep a budget down or just have something a little less trendy or traditional um, is coming into play more. Mm. And so she likely, whoever wrote this, saw other people who had maybe more pared down weddings and kind of realized at the end of the day, it's just about marrying the person that you love. And if you can have fun and, you know, treat your guests to something amazing – Absolutely. But I think you you just you never want to regret like money spent. Right. You know? Yeah, it's it's a tough thing to balance. And, you know, so much of it is wrapped up in, in the marketing. Right. It's like this so much pressure is put on it because all the messaging is this is your one special day, the best day of your life. You only get one shot at this, right. you know, and, and the whole YOLO mentality. Um, and I think that can add to the pressure to overspend and like I never want to see couples like going into debt or taking out a loan to pay for a party that they're going to then take years to pay off right. afterwards. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely something that I think every couple probably kind of weighs afterwards, like looking back on things in hindsight and thinking like what was worth it and what wasn't. And that's really something that, you know, we've tried to weave into the way that we um, you know, interview the couples in the real weddings on Budget Savvy Bride, um, just sharing like what their kind of hindsight takeaways are, because right. you can learn a lot from like the people who went before you. Sure. I mean, hindsight will always be 2020. That That's just it. So you're not ever going to know until you do it. But I think the more that you do read headlines like this, mm -hmm. the more that you see what other people have done, the more you get their retrospective on like, you know, ask your friends, read blogs, like figure out like what are things people really 
are like, yes, do this 100%. Mm -hmm. And what are things that they are iffy on? And that can help you because you're, like, you're never really going to know. But yeah. like if you research enough, you can kind of get an idea. Yeah, exactly. I think too, like what you said about kind of this trend and there are some headlines in here actually the next one on the list uh perfect segue is uh the american wedding is shrinking mm. as a result of ballooning prices um leading couples to whittle down their guest list and downsize in other ways this was in the washington post and i think you know we're seeing a lot of that couples saying like well we're just seeing costs go up and up and up and up Maybe the best thing to do is keep our guest list really small, have it be intimate, have a calmer nervous system and less pressure and stress on the day, maybe because there's just less moving pieces or um, logistics to kind of manage. And, yeah. you know, I think for some couples, that's completely the completely the right choice for them. Right. I mean, OK, I don't know, because <laughs> I would say in my experience and the weddings that I've been to. I wouldn't describe it as like shrinking. I mm. feel like they're the same as three, five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I do think though, again, the older that you get married, I think the less people you invite. I think yeah. it's just like how, I don't know, you're older and you like kind of weigh it differently maybe. It's like, are they, are you more discerning? Because when you're younger, you're more worried about like, oh, what happens if I exclude yeah. this person or not? But then as you get older, your circle maybe gets a little bit your smaller. Your circle gets smaller. And more intentional, right? Absolutely. I think it's just like kind of naturally you, you know, you're not just like friends with literally everybody that you were always friends with. Like right. you kind of see that when you're older. Um, I also think as couples are paying for their weddings themselves more, mm -hmm. there is more of that like, oh, okay, we don't need to have this person. Like we're going to, you know, and especially if it's somebody mom or dad wants you to invite, but mm -hmm. like you don't really feel comfortable or really feel they need to be there. If you are paying for it, it's like now you have the license to be like, well, we're paying. We don't really know that that, that they're going to make the cut. Right. So I will say like I have one friend who we have to bring on who did something like totally different. She mm -hmm. did like a private ceremony, just their parents um, took pictures, like gorgeous pictures um, on like a hike and it was beautiful. And then she had a barbecue mm. and they planned to do something in the future, like a bigger, just like party. Um, but the stress of just like planning all of it and having to do the logistics, they are that, that one that, like you said, decided to do like a pared down thing. But other than that, you know, I think, yes, of course, 2020, everybody kind of rethought out of necessity mm. what they would do. And we saw a ton of small things, but I do think we've rebounded from that. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, part of why they're shrinking is just because the costs are exorbitant and, <laughs> you know, you got to figure out how to do it. Um, but I also think it's like, it's just, we get married later. Yeah. And I think that really affects it. There's always going to be extremes on either end of the spectrum, like no matter what, like we are still seeing, you know, the celebrity weddings being covered that are costing millions of dollars, you know, and, um, you know, on the other side, you know, intimate elopements and things like that. But I've been like thinking about this concept of like, what is like, I feel like even in our conversations about your wedding, you know, you're like, my wedding wasn't like, b low budget by any means, but like I made strategic choices to like help, you know, allocate my resources like in ways that made sense for you yeah um and so like my I keep like toying with this term and it's like you know obviously we want to help couples plan like a savvy wedding but then I really got like into the idea of like making it sexier <laughs> and it's like uh you know how Paris Hilton she has the little catchphrase sliving I like don't, slang okay. and living oh, and I'm slang like and living like a sweating instead of a wedding. Which is what? <laughs> what does it mean? A savvy wedding. No, you're trying to make something happen. I'm Next trying headline. to make fetch happen. Okay? You're trying. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it so, sounds too much like yeah. sweat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Can't blame a girl for trying. <laughs> okay, so... Next up was another sort of like opinion piece about our weddings on the way out. My fiance and I dodged it with no regrets. And they basically just did the courthouse thing instead right. of having a party at all. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we've touched on this in previous episodes. I don't think weddings are on the way out. Yeah. I just think there's now more options that people feel are available to them. So I think more and more people do feel the permission. Like, I think these people probably 
are people that wouldn't have wanted the big wedding but would have had it because they thought they had to. Mm. And now they're like, oh, well, I don't have to. Yeah. But I still think there's tons of other people who want that big wedding. Yeah. They're yeah. always going to happen. Yeah. Anywhere, any culture, like weddings are here to stay. Yes. They definitely are. Um, so next up was a story about uh like modern wedding trends that won't last. And a lot of the things referenced in this article were the more traditional elements that we've talked a lot about on the podcast, obviously, um, and like where they came from. But I think like to your point, like it's just representative of the many different like shapes and forms that weddings can take. And, um, you know, really just going with what matters the most to you and your partner. Yeah, I think just in general, like, you know, people just feel like we're as a society, we're more, we hope, <laughs> like welcoming mm. to different things. And, you know, there like was a time where LGBTQ couples couldn't get married. And like if they wanted to and it was this, like they had people that didn't support them or understand them, like, you know, it was – it was so, so much more tension there of like doing something outside of the norm. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, we're moving away from that. We're accepting much more, yeah. you know. And so I think part of that is accepting people feeling empowered to do things that they want to do differently. And like being able to step into it and say, hey, a wedding can look like whatever I want it to look like in a way that that just wasn't like a welcomed thing. You know, it was all like. Martha Stewart and I don't know, it was just like a very specific thing. You know, it was like templatized, as you're saying. And also it was, you know, if you didn't get married, if you didn't choose marriage, like you were looked at differently, like you were treated differently. You couldn't do things. You couldn't own land. Like there's just <laughs> things that have drastically changed that I think are why. For the better. Right, for the better. <laughs> and I think that's why like we're able to see – different size, different shape, different everything when it comes to weddings. Speaking of, we have to talk about the New York City subway wedding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Okay. This, this is my favorite headline. <laughs> so for anybody who didn't see this, um, a couple literally got married on the L train in New York City on the subway. Um, like, and so I did read this article because I was curious, like, how did they pull this off? Mm -hmm. There was a table. There was a cake. There were decorations. Um, people were dancing, like, just incredible. And so I did read the article, and they did have to get, like, clearance from the oh, MTA. Okay. Um, which, yeah, like, that does make sense. I wasn't sure about that. Cause right. Because if you were, like, on your way to work and you were commuting and this was happening, you'd could be you so imagine? mad. imagine? Right. And that would, like, totally ruin the vibe. Yeah. Um, so they did, uh, I don't know what you know, in particular was involved in that, but they did have to get like that clearance. Mm. Um, but like the videos on social media just looked like they were having the time of their lives. Yeah. I mean, people did have tickets for that wedding. They did? You, well, you need a Metro card. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking the other thing. Anyway, <laughs> like I, I just, I, how they came up with it. I mean, I, it did say in the article something about like, uh, maybe they like, I don't know if they met. Can you imagine if they met on the L train and Aww, they got married? That would be I don't very think romantic. That. It would be. But I think like. Talk I, about it meant leaving your story like yeah. into your wedding. Totally. I just like that would never, ever cross my mind. And. I, but it's just proof that a wedding can truly look like whatever you want it yeah. to look like. And what I loved about that. A uh, couple in particular is like the fact that you, they literally like brought tables on the subway. Like yeah. they had to have like buy in and like uh, assistance from like their yeah. people to help set that up and sure. make it happen. There was a cake. Yeah. <laughs> and like a full on dance party. A full on dance party. I mean, that's a vibe. Yeah. I, I mean, I would love to like stumble up upon something like that happening mm -hmm. and just like experience that joy like and witness it. Like, I mean, I just think there's nothing like cooler than that. Yeah. I just love when couples, like, really go their own way. Mm -hmm. um, the New York Times reported on 
a couple making their wedding a politics free zone and how couples are like navigating families with like differing political opinions. So how did they how did they make it politics free? So they were taking steps to ensure their weddings remained free of political discussions. They I think they had like signage that had no politics. <laughs> discussion could you imagine like we were talking in another episode about like the um what un unplugged yeah unplugged ceremony, ceremony signs but could you imagine walking in and seeing like a no politics zone <laughs> sign I at a wedding and um i have to do one of my famous hot takes to oh, the camera okay it's not a hot take it's just a take to the camera okay weddings are political <laughs> so that's what i'll say um and we there is an episode i think we've kind of took a deep dive into why why that is. Um, but just inherently, like, your wedding is a political thing. Yeah. Um, you are getting married to somebody to be legally recognized under law as, mm -hmm. you know. A joint entity. A, exactly, as a union, <laughs> as a joint entity. Um, look, do I think that some, you know, uncles and aunts and grandpas and dads are – you know, out here yelling about politics in a way that maybe they weren't a long time ago. Yes. Or is it more divisive at this point? Yes. Um, I can see being nervous about like the family all being together and like, cause maybe Thanksgiving looked like that and yeah. everybody just yelled at each other. So I can see the concern, mm -hmm. um, like not wanting it to be a thing, right? Yeah. Like just everybody put that aside and celebrate love. How um, hard should it be on one day? <laughs> right. I almost feel like, though, like calling it out. Right. Makes, uh, would make it worse. I don't know. Right. Um, Again, it's one of those things. It's hard to know, like, how big of an issue that really was for that couple yeah. or these couples who were interviewed for the article to feel the need to go to those lengths. Yeah. I also just feel like, you know, if you... Look, not everyone's going to get up and dance, but I feel like if you're creating an atmosphere mm -hmm. of like in inclusion and getting everybody involved and like making it a party, like they shouldn't have time to talk about that. Yeah. Talk true. about the people getting married. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Keep the focus on what matters mm -hmm. in all aspects, guests and couple alike. Um, so, uh, the most recent one that I have here is, can you have a stylish wedding for under $5,000? These couples did. I was actually interviewed as part of this article. Oh, uh, <laughs> she was plug. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think it, I loved seeing this personally and I was so glad to hear that the New York Times was covering this, especially because so much of the publication you know, and media spectacle around weddings is about the high cost, which yeah. makes it feel like that's the only way to do it in some regards. And like, if you don't have this average amount of money, you won't be able to have a wedding at all. And that's right. just simply not true. And like, we've seen that in many cases, in all shapes and forms on Budget Savvy Bride with the real weddings that we've published over the years. Right. But what, so describe their wedding. Like how many people did they have? How many right. guests? Well, and, and that's very true. It's like a lot of them are smaller right. guest counts for sure. Or the couples are literally DIYing everything. And so I think there's like an element of like realism that needs to be brought to it. And I think this article did a great job of doing that because they interviewed several couples who talked about like some of them made their own meals, like literally the entire catering for the wedding. That's a lot to take on. Not every couple is going to want to do that. Not every couple is going to have like access to like a community around them to make that happen. But if you are working with a, a small budget and that's all you have to spend and you still want to include people, you can do it, but you're going to have to DIY almost everything yeah. for that, you know, to make it happen. Right. And it's like, look, yes, <laughs> you can do that. And it's not going to look like the wedding that everybody no. pictures. I uh, know. And it's not going to look like a Martha Stewart wedding cover mag right. uh, magazine wedding. And that's the thing that like, you know, I know it's a headline and great. Um, it has to entice you in. <laughs> but it's like there is a certain cost that is just going to be there if you are feeding and supplying drinks for 100 plus people. For sure. That's just – even if you're feeding them, I don't know, McDonald's, like <laughs> it, there's a certain cost that comes with just the sheer volume. Yeah. And if you like, but 
as we have proven time and time again, a wedding doesn't have to be that. It's a choice. It's a way you can go. You can do so many other things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if you're making all the food, like you got to buy all the food. So it depends how many people you're feeding still. Um, And and time time is also money. (laughs) You're saying at the same time, time is also money. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think like, it's so funny because my my father in law actually had mm. seen uh, a newspaper article like in a in a Philly newspaper and he like saved it like for us when we we came Aww. home. He was it's about couples in Philly who were getting married on much smaller budgets mm-hmm. and there was, was he like, like oh you guys are spending too much why don't you read this article <laughs> it was after the wedding <laughs> oh, okay but um it was just and because of this but yeah. um so cute uh, but it was like about uh, specifically I think like a company that's doing micro weddings mm-hmm. and. It's like, so you catch the headline and you're like, oh, how did people pull off a wedding for so much less money? And it's like, well, because they did it differently. Yeah. Which is great. Like, there is no shame to that. But it's, it, like, is it possible? Like, I know you always ask, like, is it possible? And yeah, it's possible, but it's not possible to have a certain number of people with a certain amount of food doing a certain amount of things. Professionally executed Pro- by exactly. vendors. Yeah, that's right. that's the real delineation, right. right? And we'll go more in depth on this on another episode. We just have way too much to talk okay. about when okay. it comes to that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think it's so true. And it does like bear mentioning yeah. like, the differences professional execution and outsourcing everything or taking on the bulk of everything yourself. Yep. So. Absolutely. So the last one I have on our list here is about the lab grown diamond boom is over. Do we think that that's true? No. <laughs> <laughs> what you should have take, done a take to the camera again. <laughs> no. Um, Ryan will be so happy that she got some stage time. Yeah. Um, she, she. Does she have a name? <laughs> no. Um, okay. Okay. Well, first of all, we're going to actually deep dive into this yes. later. We have a special segment that we're going to talk all about this with um, our friends at Mia Donna. So Perfect. we'll get into it a little m- more. Um, but do I think that that boom is over? So here's the thing. I will say that while I was looking for my ring, while I was, you know, doing all of that, which is over a year ago, mm-hmm. um, in that time, I do think the lab grown thing was gaining more traction. I think... Uh, for me, I was attracted to it because of the ethical part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, blood diamonds is a thing. I, you know, didn't want to be contributing to that. The retailer that I use donates a portion of the sales to like environmental projects. And, uh, it felt a little bit like I've always been like a little bit, I don't know, like nervous about having like such a big purchase on my hand. Mm-hmm. Um, I just felt better about that purchase, not just being for like this expensive thing on my hand and like, I don't know, it felt a little bit more purposeful. Mm. Um, And I would say in that time, I, you know, like most of my friends didn't have one. I kind of felt like I was a little on the forefront of like, really, you know, yeah. And then recently, and I'll say in the last like few months, Mm -hmm. a big thing on TikTok in particular is like people trying to normalize like the, you know, showing of their engagement ring thing, but it's like a small rock Mm. because for so long it's been about how big can you get. Right. And a lot of people have chosen lab grown diamonds because you can get bigger bigger for less money. Yeah. But I do think, and I don't, I don't maybe, I don't really know where it started or where it came from, but definitely have seen a bit of a switch from like how big can it get to people being like, let's embrace a smaller ring. Mm. I don't know. I, let's bring in the experts. Uh, yes. You know, let's bring in our friends from Mia Donna. They can help us kind of figure out what this one really is. I don't think they're going anywhere, but okay. I'm really excited to hear what our guest has to say. Great. All right. Welcome, Anamika. Thank you for joining us. Thank Anamika, you. she's from Mia Donna. Yes. And tell us about Mia Donna for a second, and then we'll get into exactly what we want to talk about with you. Wonderful. Well, Mia Donna is um, a lab grown diamond company, but we're so much more than that. We are a social enterprise. Wow. Yeah. And I actually founded the company Mia Donna back in 2005 when I had found out I had actually purchased a conflict diamond myself. Wow. And I always thought I was a really conscious consumer, mm-hmm. you know, and I and, uh, thought I was doing everything everything right. And then but by, by buying this product, 
um, I had actually fallen for the same tricks of greenwashing and, um, you know, big business. And so I thought, you know what, I've got to do something to make this right in my own mind. I actually grew up in foster care myself. And um, so I kind of put myself into the position of these children in diamond mining communities that really do not uh, prosper from diamonds at all. And so I thought, how can I make this right in my own mind? So I started sponsoring a little boy in a mining community and his mother. And that was going to be the extent of my philanthropy um, until something unexpected happened and we actually developed a relationship through letters. And it was my children and this little boy and his mother. Um, and so I got a really unbiased look of what it was like for these people, these families, to live in a mining community. Mm. Um, and then I'll never forget the day he wrote to me and said, I had a great summer because only one of my classmates was killed. Oh, oh my god! And it's just said so, like, you know, it's so accepting that that's just his reality. Um, and as a mother myself, I thought there's no way I can. This is this can't be all I can do. I have to do more. And I saw how much my sponsorship was doing for them. And so I was like, how could I do this on a larger scale? And so that's that's how Mia Donna and my foundation, the Greener Diamond, were born. It was like, let's sell conflict-free fine jewelry, and then with our profits, we'll go back into these mining communities and reinvest. Seemed so simple to me <laughs> <laughs> at the time. Uh, soon found out that nothing that came out of the earth could be considered conflict-free. And so that's when I turned to science and started working with scientists in a lab to create a diamond. Wow. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I like me, you know, five minutes ago trying to even explain was so not even close. Um, first of all, that's incredible. Um, I totally like agree when I was my time to look for a mm -hmm. diamond. I knew I didn't want and I was calling it a blood diamond. Like that was kind yeah, of the association. Uh, same term. Yeah. yeah. And I knew I didn't want that. Um, but I think it's just so beautiful, like the extent to which it moved you enough to create a revolution almost. Absolutely. <laughs> with, you know, and uh, OK, I, I want to. I always ahead. tell people it's, it's, you know, your story in life. Everyone has a story. Yeah. But it's what you do with that story that counts. And so, sure, I had to spend some time in foster care. I didn't have the traditional nuclear family that everyone mm -hmm. else had. But I used that experience to put a positive spin on it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so that's really where the passion comes from with me, Adonna. Can you tell us where the little boy was living? In, in Liberia, okay. in a small community um, outside of Monrovia. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, give us a little bit more um, just background into like how diamonds from the earth mm -hmm. are mined because I don't think people really actually know that. Yeah. There's many different ways. I mean, obviously there's big industrial mining and then there's small artesian mining. Uh, the, the biggest problem is, is that diamonds lose their origin. So, you know, in a lot of conflict products and a lot of conflict materials, that's done intentionally. So we don't know where they're from. Mm. Okay. So we can't pinpoint, okay, was this conflict or was this mm. not? Uh, one out of nine diamonds, um, are, we can only trace one in nine diamonds back to the origin. So it's oh. it's all mixed up. We don't know what is what. Big lack of transparency. Exactly. Like so many other things. <laughs> well, it's the reason why diamonds have been left off, off the stock exchange. There's no legal way to determine its value. And so oh. it's left up to like the seven top mining companies that are determined its value yeah. for us. So um, it, they're just basically um, untraceable funds, the original Bitcoin. <laughs> um, and, you know, unfortunately, people are enslaved to mine for diamonds still in 2024, raped, murdered, you name it, it's still all happening. And they fund terrorist attacks, uh, wars, you mm. name it. Um, um, unfortunately, that's still happening today. Yeah. So if that doesn't convince you to consider lab grown over Yeah, I don't know what will. The alternative. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but let's go deeper into that. Like there's so much misinformation I mm -hmm. think out there about lab grown diamonds. Sure. Can you just give like a 101 on what a lab grown diamond is? <laughs> a lab grown diamond is a diamond. Yes. Snaps. <laughs> 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 <Not. laughs> yes. Um lab, a lab grown diamond is a diamond. Think about ice in your freezer. You know, we are creating uh, an environment in which if we put water and then the natural conditions, then it will turn into ice. Right. That's similar to what we're doing with with diamonds in carbon. We're just mimicking the natural conditions that happen in the earth to create a diamond mm. in a chamber of heat and pressure. That's such a great um, analogy. To grow diamonds. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I wish I'd had that before because I like definitely 
was the first like in my family to even like know really what a labyrinth diamond is. Mm -hmm. And like when I started shopping with my fiance for my engagement ring, I like I knew that that's what I wanted. I didn't want to look at anything else. And they were like, so what it what it. Is it a real? Is, is it, it a, a diamond? Fake diamond? It, is what it is? A real? Yeah. yeah. What is the? Fa it, it's fake. Right. What? Did, what? No, but but is it, you're saying it's real. What is it? And that is the best way. I mean, I think I kind of. I I would say like they're recreating in a lab what is necessary to create a diamond in the earth. Correct. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I think that that is amazing. Okay. <laughs> what year did you get? Were you searching for your ring? If you don't mind uh, me asking. 2023. Okay. So so quite recently. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you should, I mean, I was doing this in, in two thousand five, and, and there yeah. were there were two labs. That's I'm sure. It. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, the you got some pushback. It sounds like, and I was like, gosh, <laughs> you could imagine what what we got. It was like you're gonna do what? You're gonna grow what? Where? And what are you doing with your profits? <laughs> like it was just this crazy out there idea that no one could really con. Yeah. Conceive. Well, and I'm just wondering, is it like messaging from let's call it Big Diamond? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that, oh, well, that's not real. Or like your fiance didn't want to spend more or whatever to get you a real diamond. Like, is that something that? Well, right. We were just looking at a headline from 2024 that is suggesting that the lab grown diamond boom mm -hmm. is bursting. Mm hmm. Maybe it was well, funded yeah, by Big Diamond. <laughs> so a little bit of, of history is that um, there were originally two labs that I was working with. To grow, to grow diamonds. One of them went out of business a long time ago, said, you know, they'd, they'd put too much money in it and no one's ever going to want to mm -hmm. buy a lab-grown diamond. And that was mainly because the FTC were putting a lot of rules on us on how we could describe a lab-grown diamond. So we had to call them synthetic or artificial oh. or fake diamonds. And that what? was basically set forth by the mining industry. Big of diamonds. diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so... In, more more players enter the market with growing diamonds. And so we decided, you know, we're stronger together than than we are apart. So there was only seven, seven of us back then, too. Mm -hmm. And so we joined together and created the International Growing Diamond Association. And so then we went back to the FTC, and that was our first um, item on our agenda. It was to talk to the FTC and work out a solution because lab growing diamonds, our technology, was um, creating diamonds that were better than anything would get out of the earth. Um, and so there had to be a solution with this. And so in 2019, the FTC actually changed the rules. And just to summarize it, uh, they say it, that a diamond is a diamond, doesn't matter um, the origin if they're chemically, physically, and optically identical. And so wow. that's why you've seen since 2019, lab grown diamonds explode because it was actually okay to sell them now right. with the right terminology. Yeah. So we have been talking about we think, I mean, personally, I feel like, and obviously I wanted one. So I felt like that really took off kind of in more recent years mm -hmm. and people, A, understood the benefits of it, um, but B, also could get a bigger diamond. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Bigger, um, better diamond. Yeah. yeah, we all want that. <laughs> yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, I think that for a while it was like, almost like the status of your ring was like the size, yeah. you know, um, certainly like even on social media, but c celebrities, anybody, it was like measured by how big. Right. Uh, and I was telling Jess, I have seen recently some people trying to reverse that of like, let's make my small rock just as important. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know, I'm just curious to hear from you, like, what I mean, it doesn't really matter whether they're getting it because they want it to be bigger or not, like getting it is better than not. But do you feel like that is like the number one factor for a lot of buyers mm -hmm. that they can get bigger for less? Sure. There's definitely that customer out there. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say before the big boom in 2019, when we changed the rulings with the FTC, before that, it was more people aligning with our ethics. Right. People mm -hmm. just, you know, I, a lot of people came to us and said, you know, I, I thought I didn't want a diamond until I found you. Yeah. Like, you're doing mm -hmm. it right. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was very much our customer for a long time. And then the big boom happened and we still have those customers. But now we've drawn in a whole lot more customers that, that did want that two carat but knew they would never get it. And now they can. So um, a diamond is for everyone really now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, you know, the marketing campaign that like started it all, like a diamond is forever mm -hmm. was like the reason Absolutely. people wanted the engagement ring, like changing it up. A diamond is for everyone. For everyone. And, 
you have some here. I do. Yes. That yes. you can demonstrate. I mean, I <laughs> think Which they're hard to look away from because they yeah. are so sparkly. They're so sparkly. Um, one thing we were going to ask, and I think maybe you can kind of show us with these, but like, do the four C's <laughs> still apply, right? And Absolutely. it's so funny. I feel like the four C's is like a very old, like, it's like not for the modern person. Yeah. Um, but that's like the only thing people have to go with when they're like trying to judge. Because the naked eye like can't sure. judge what a diamond is. So, yeah. um, and I don't know. And the four C's are confusing. It, they're so confusing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even when they explain it to you, you're like, oh, yeah, no, I have no idea. <laughs> yes, it's still very important because that's how we determine the diamond's value. That's mm -hmm. how it's graded. You always want to buy a diamond if it's lab grown or earth mined with a third party uh, grading certification mm -hmm. from okay. GIA or IGI. Um, and there's a few others out there that are really good. Um, because that's going to give you a, a, an unbiased opinion on what the grades are for the diamond because um, the color, someone might say it's a D and someone else might say it's an F and that could be a thousand dollars difference in wow, the price. Yeah. Wow, yeah. So you really want a good uh, grading certificate. So yes, it's very important. Um, but you know, it doesn't need to be confusing. That's what I always try and tell my customers that, that um, if you have someone that is going to be your advocate, not someone that's working on commission that just wants a bigger sale. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell you the, you know, the four C's and, and what you should do. I have a really good general rule of thumb that your cut is the most important. The cut breathes the light and the, you know, the brightness into mm. the diamond that we really love. And so you, if you go up in the cut grade, you can kind of fudge and go down a little bit in the color and the clarity okay. because the brightness and the reflection will mask a lot of those imperfections. That's a savvy tip. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's um, st uh, another savvy tip is um, <laughs> diamonds are priced in tiers, and a lot of people don't realize that in carat tiers. So there's a different price from like a half carat to a 0.99, and then from a one to like a 1.99, they all have different Ooh. grades. So if you buy a carat that's at a, a two carat, Mm. It's going to be in a higher pricing bracket than one that's maybe 1.99 or 1.98, and there's no no difference to the naked oh eye. Oh my at goodness, all. that is such a savvy tip. <laughs> I love that. And you know, a lot of a lot of people selling diamonds will not tell you that they want they don't want you to know this this kind of stuff. But right, because um, yeah, going that 1.01 exactly, over gets them more commission. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh. I mean. I well, let's take a look first yeah. at this gorgeous jewelry. Yeah. So I, I brought one here actually, just to show you a bit of um, where Miadonna has come. The first one in this this little little container here because it's so small. Oh. We need a container for Hi. it. Hi, baby. Uh, that was the first time diamond we ever created in two thousand six. That's uh, so cool. Right. Um, That's the first one. Yes. yes. <gasps> it's yellow in this color. Is like an artifact. You're holding it in your <laughs> hands. Yes. That's so special. But it's yellow in color and it's 0. 0.25 carats. Uh -huh. It's the tiniest, wow. yellowest little thing in the it's world. So cute. Um, and then the one above it was um, the largest lab grown diamond we created in America at six point two eight carats. But that was in two thousand sixteen. Um, and then we'll be in New York. Fashion Week this week, uh, Dubai with um, a 21 carat pendant necklace. Wow. Yeah. I actually have that right here and we can pick it up and, and you can 21. Oh play with my. It. You're going to let me touch this? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Diamonds are meant to be played with. Oh <laughs> my word. Stop it. This looks like the heart of the ocean. Right? <laughs> From Titanic. 21 carats. It's like an ice skating rink, guys. Your poly, your poly pocket could ice skate on the on the That's surface of gorgeous. it. That's gorgeous. It's stunning. I also love that we, yeah, I want to see it. I want to hold it. <laughs> oh, baby. oh, my God, it's gorgeous. That's insane. Don't drop it into the ocean. <laughs> that is so cool. I think it's just also so beautiful that we could, like, see. I, I'm so glad you showed it to us in that, yes. like, history lesson of, like, the, the, the first one, the biggest one at one point, yeah. and then the biggest one now. And it's such a cool thing because science is allowing us to do these amazing things. Like, it's going to continue to get better and better. Completely. And I, I don't know, just even hearing, like, I knew we were going to get an expert, but, like, <laughs> you are the start of this. Literally. Which is, yeah. And it's phenomenal. And I, I just wish that the narrative about conflict-free diamonds mm. was much more in the forefront. And, than, like, more concretely explained. Yeah, like, and, right. People need to hear this. Yeah. Well, there's even more to that that we can go into is that, like I said before, with the 
the kind of explosion of the the market growing with lab grown diamonds, um, there's a lot of cheaper diamonds coming into the market that again, like the earth mine diamonds, have lost their origin because mm. they're sold by right. a lot of middlemen. So I don't like to blanket it that lab all lab grown diamonds are conflict free or sustainable because mm. if I don't know where they're coming from, how can we say that? Got it. So um, there are high quality lab grown diamonds and there's a lot cheaper lab grown diamonds on the market now. So I'm always warning consumers, you really want to go with a, uh, with a retailer that's also a manufacturer like me and Donna that's growing their own diamonds. Got it. And it's going to have, it, you know, the certifications is the proof. We are, uh, we've been B Corp certified since 2019 and all our diamonds are graded by the GIA. So, okay. That's it's important. A, a mm -hmm. yeah. part about being, you know, a smart and savvy consumer right. is really like knowing where these things are coming from. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, the origin of your products and in any area and whatever you're buying. So what would you say to the people that are basically trying to insinuate that lab grown diamonds mm -hmm. are causing the value of earth mined diamonds to decrease? Before lab grown diamonds came on the market, earth mined diamonds, before lab grown diamonds came around, uh, earth mined diamonds were already losing their value. So it's kind of like the scapegoat. Okay, let's blame it on something and and that's what we will I, I mean in your generation as well like everyone was kind of like pulling back from that old mined industries yeah. like you know mm -hmm. it's just not right for today's society yep. I mean mining has the largest carbon footprint than any other form of human activity wow. um, and consumers these days you know they don't put up with the BS right. any, anymore and, and education and is more available exactly mm -hmm. people exactly. know about it yes yeah. and peers you know peers you know we all talk yeah um, and so yeah information flows a lot faster now. Um, so yes, I, I would say that, um, that you know, so lab-grown diamonds have been a bit of a scapegoat with that as well. But lab-grown diamonds are, is a relatively new industry. So we're still trying to find the, the right spot as well. So there is a little bit of fluctuation, um, but consumers need to know that with that fluctuation, it, there are the high quality lab-grown diamonds that aren't going to be cheap, okay? <laughs> they're going to be they're going to be about half the cost of an earth mine diamond, so relatively less expensive. But um, you know, if you find something that just feels too cheap and too inexpensive, it's it's it moistenite. Is, it's too good to be true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. True. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of greenwashing going on with that. Well, I'm sure. and fifty percent is still a significant savings. Absolutely. Yes. And I always say people come to us though that they have the same budget if if they were going to buy an earth mine diamond, right. but they're getting twice the diamond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. And I think, too, like these younger generations really do value, you know, the the ethics behind a business and will resonate with that message a lot, you know. And they want the receipts more. Like, yeah. you know, we work much more conscious now. And it's, it's interesting because I do think a diamond specifically for an engagement ring for a long time was passed down, mm -hmm. you know, so the value also came from like being an heirloom. Um, and that sentimental value. Too. Right. And sentimental value. Mm -hmm. And like you're not losing that, you're able to start it from your generation mm -hmm. and continue to pass it down. Um, and so I, I don't know. I, I also think a lot of people have been taking that real quote unquote, you know, earth mine diamond that was passed down and then switching it out for a bigger <laughs> lab round diamond. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Putting a little upgrade pendant upgrade later down the yeah. road. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So would you say that there's any, I mean, this is always a hard thing to answer, but I feel like specifically with engagement rings and maybe even wedding jewelry we can get to, but engagement rings specifically, are there any trends that you are seeing in terms of style, cut, anything mm -hmm. like that? Um, that you would predict for 2025 to be like mm. the hot item? <laughs> so right now we're seeing a lot of more minimalistic engagement rings, uh -huh. bigger diamonds. And I think that's because of the lab grown diamonds. Sure. Um, better cuts as well, because in lab grown, we can actually cut better because we're not we're not working with a rough that could be a really weird shape. Mm -hmm. We can create our rough in the shape that we want and then cut it. It's so, so it's freaking cool. Right? I mean, <laughs> so I get better thought cut of diamonds. jewelry as just fashion, but it's science too in this oh, case. Yeah, it is for sure. A woman in the sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> Love to see it. <laughs> um, so I, th I think that trend will continue continue um the the elongated diamonds are really in fashion which is like the ovals or the emeralds mm. or the, <laughs> the uh radio yeah, i'm like looking at this know, beautiful oval beautiful? right here <laughs> going uh, shopping i, I mean ring. kind yes. of <laughs> It's um, probably too tiny for my finger, but But you can wow. see right here, Beautiful. this one is I actually... I can't stop looking. <laughs> <laughs> so where I, I think it's going to go is a lot of people buy one engagement ring 
and then a couple of bands and they do a yes. stack. Now it's the stack of the engagement ring because this is actually two solitaire rings oh, what? in two different shapes that I've just stacked oh. on top of each other. Trend setting. Right. Um, and now that, with, you know, with the cost of Earthmine Diamonds, you can buy two, <laughs> not just wow. one. Uh, sorry, oh with lab grow, cost of lamb growing diamonds. So, yeah. That's, that's where I see coming, coming down. I'm so glad. I'm just so glad I asked that, but also I'm getting too many ideas. <laughs> My husband's not going to be great. Um, I, that, that was amazing. Um, right. Is there anything else before we close out that you want anybody like watching this or listening to this to mm -hmm. walk away from when it comes to Mia Donna or Lab Grown Jewelry? I think my biggest thing right now with the media, I mean, I've been talking about lab-grown diamonds for 20 years now. And before it was lab-grown diamonds are real. You know, they are chemically, physically and optically identical. I really feel a lot of consumers get that now. Mm. Okay. We have the technology. This is the evolution of the diamond. Mm -hmm. Now, my big message is not all lab-grown diamonds are conflict-free and sustainable. Mm. Um, I feel that's a huge misconception that people just blanket. I see it ads all the time, sustainable diamonds, sustainable diamonds and lab-grown diamonds. And then I'm like, okay, well, who are they certified by? Do you have any third party verifications? Where are they made? How are they cut? No one knows because they just magically appear in their store. And that mm. was always the problem with Earthmine Diamonds. If you can't trace it back to the source, then I, I really have a hard time purchasing it. And so you really need to be careful of that. So just for clarity's sake, like where are like what are the ways that they're not sustainable or could mm -hmm. possibly be, you know, from a source that's not Conflict, ethical? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, I don't know. <laughs> there, there's a lot of a lot of Chinese companies now growing love grown diamonds. And so there's no way I can ever tell what what are the labor laws there? What it takes right. a lot of energy to grow diamonds. Mm. And that's just a, a, a fact of growing diamonds. And so we're we actually use 30 percent renewable energy right now with a goal of being 100 percent by this time next year. Oh. And so if we're if we're doing 100 percent renewable energy, then we're not even using electricity. So how much right. electricity are these other companies using? Got I've got it. no idea. Mm. And a lot of times that that comes from fossil fuels and so right. are they really eco-friendly i'm not sure right. that's why you just you need to dig into the company in which you're cre creating them versus just blanketing them that they're lab grown diamond they're conflict free there's so much more that goes into this than i ever even thought this <laughs> has been so educational yeah. honestly yes thank you so much for being you're with welcome. us thank and for you. sharing all of this yes, and for it's fun. the work that you've done because it's truly amazing amazing thank you thank you so much thanks for tuning in to the bouquet toss from the team at the budget savvy bride.com the bouquet toss is a love stories tv podcast please don't forget to rate review and subscribe on all of your favorite streaming channels and follow budget savvy bride on social media as always stay savvy and stay tuned for our next episode